So the full uh, description for today's uh, presentation is to stop putting lipstick on the pig, cut the crap and the noise and move marketing a deal closer to becoming a science. Now that's possibly what you didn't set, uh, sign up for, but I'll take you on a wee journey nevertheless and we can hopefully you'll enjoy yourself. Now, that's some time ago in the 80s and that big hunk of a guy there, a her sweet guy, is yours truly in his lab coat. Things were an awful lot nicer then. And, uh, oops. and that's horrible bacteria I was playing with at the time. I was a micro medical microbiologist and uh, I quite liked that, that line of work because it seemed to me to be authentic and honest. And indeed, I had a purpose of no, no less. It was all very simple. You, you guys will probably either kind of cloud over or you'll go into spasms thinking about all these uh, equations that you possibly had in an earlier life or at school. And, but again, these things were robust, you know, a, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, blah de blah. And uh, it was a finite world. We had these kind of equations that we could test. And we could look at those equations and improve things in, in our line of work, in our discipline, in our science, and in our businesses. And uh, as I said, it was very comfortable because it was difficult, but at least you had something to test your assumptions against. And of course, as I said, the one overriding thing was, as a professional microbiologist and, and then industrial chemist, we had a shared purpose. I was looking for a healthy population. And I thought, well, actually, that's not too bad. You know, when you're talking about purpose and mission statements and goals and objectives and aims and all sorts of wonderful business terms, at least in those days, I actually had a purpose which was a shared purpose with the, my colleagues and the, the clients or customers, which was, of course, a healthy population. Now, circa 1991 or thereabouts, Goodness knows, I look a lot younger than that, don't I? This is when you say, surely not. Um, I wasn't at school in 1991, but uh, I moved into marketing and I thought, well, this is what I thought marketing was like. You know, a nice wee village market, people helping each other, goods and services being exchanged and having a, a whale of a time effectively. And I thought it was quite simple as well. Goods and services, we supply goods and services and we get money for it, which I thought was pretty good. And it was also based on expertise and effort. So if you made more effort or you had greater expertise, then you were giving greater value. Likewise, the, the customer or whomever was receiving greater value. And of course, moving into marketing, I thought, well, as I was a scientist or a quasi scientist, at least, I thought, well, moving into marketing surely is going to be similarly um, fortuitous because we're actually satisfying needs, which was the first definition I was given. You know, and there's tons of other um, definitions for marketing, competitiveness and all the rest of it. But again, it was this starting with defining a customer need. And I thought, well, that, that kind of that entertains the scientist in me. We have all these lovely matrices and Boston boxes and all these spreadsheets and things that us marketers like. And we have the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And there was a ton of problems and challenges in marketing. It went from the four P's of marketing up to the 27 P's of marketing. And I managed to bring it down to the 17 P's of marketing. And it was still too, there was just too much going on. But again, though, it challenged me and I thought, I'm a scientist, I can cope with this, matching needs with customer, uh, sorry, company resources at a profit, sounds good to me. And the basic thing was profit equals revenue minus cost. I thought this is an easy world, surely. But I very quickly noticed, and it's not a trite statement to make, that there wasn't any shared purpose because I was working for the boss, working for the company, working for a very large company. It was a, 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 the largest company in its field, multinational company, and it didn't have a shared purpose with its customer. Strangely enough, since it was in the safety industry, you'd think it would have one. And I very quickly got a bit despondent because I thought the whole business of marketing, competitiveness, etc., etc., making your businesses better, I thought, well, shit, I did my postgraduate diploma in international marketing at what was Paisley University then, and I found out it very was just like sticking lipstick on the pig. And it was like mad men. You know, we thought we had it. We thought, well, a customer need? <sighs> what does the customer know anyway? That's what I got once. And, uh, and by the way, the customers don't need to know what needs they have because we haven't created it for them yet. You know, it was like a kind of Donald Rumsfeld moment that we don't know what we don't know what we don't know or whatever. You know, it just it, it was beyond me because I was looking for another science and something a little bit more robust and, and useful. And I found that it was about persuasion as opposed to purpose. And I thought there was a fundamental difference in this because presumably markets 
marketing came from the market, which was all about helping human beings, not actually talking about persuasion. And seduction was the, obje uh, was, was the goal. And the objective for marketing, and we all use these terms, is to grab market share and to exploit the customers and exploit new markets. And I just found the terminology a bit odd. So I was getting a bit pissed off, you could say, at that time. And I thought this is as good as it got. You know, we started telling, making sure the customers didn't make, sorry, our clients or, or the company we worked for as marketers didn't make a mistake. And that says, don't touch yourself, ask the staff, thank you. Now we just, you know, at best we were to make sure that they didn't make a mistake. So polishing the, polishing the turd, lipstick on the pig, or just making sure they didn't make any huge mistakes in the marketplace. And then of course it got worse. You got the advent of everything, digital. It's Instagram today, Twitter tomorrow. What's it gonna be the day after? Twitter, how long is it gonna last? You know, blah, blah, blah. So we just got more and more and more and this was what was, was happening in marketing. We're sending without receiving and broadcasting without listening. And I've always found it strange how it was all very well in the days of the 50s when you had a, you know, a radio program or a, an advert in a newspaper or a television where you just fired things out and somebody got a hold of it and responded. But nowadays, surely we've got the technology that we should be doing more, much more listening than we do broadcasting. And indeed, I started to join the, the CIM, the Chartered Institute of Marketing. I ran there a technology group for some time because I thought that's interesting because I'm a technologist for goodness sake. I'm still an engineer scientist at heart and they weren't bloody listening to their members. That's another story entirely, I'll tell you that over a pint. Um, but the, we as marketers were still not enabling companies to listen properly to the marketplace. Now, effectively this was one of the, the core constraints, the core co uh, problems at the bottom of the whole marketing problem. And that is effectively that we do want to make money now and in the future. So in order to do that, we have to make and deliver things as cheaply as possible and what thing gives us the greatest margin. That's what all the textbooks tell you. That's what your accountant will tell you. Your finance director will tell you. The chattering classes, Scottish enterprise, etc., etc., will tell you. So in order to do that, we have to effectively do things based on what our perceptions are of value. Because when you hear value add all the time, it's this one of these nebulous kind of uh, phrases like uh, quality and solutions. But we have to give value based on our perceptions of what we do, what we want to do, of course, and our concept of value. And effectively, that means we start to go down the road of giving less. It's always the case when you get into trouble, we're always trying to cut costs, regardless of the size of the company. And that always leads to, as you know, uh, a lack of uh, service and, and, and good products. So we're predisposed almost to give less. Yet on the other hand, we do want to provide things of marked value to the market and get the largest returns for our efforts, investments and resources. So to do that, we have to make sure that we do things based on the value and the needs of the market as opposed to us. And this is an absolute huge conflict. And, and, and in effect, we keep going for the top because of the, the, the strains and things that are put upon us. So the market wants more. It wants us to create better value as far as they're concerned. Uh, but we as companies try to provide actually less and exploit and we have to grab value. And you can almost put it as in terms of efficiency versus effectiveness. There's so much on the go about quality systems and efficiency and lean manufacturing and all these kind of things that we can polish the internal furniture in companies. And it's all about efficiency. There's very rarely things about effectiveness, about how you can actually create value in the marketplace. Although it is improving, it must be said. So on top of all of that, again, I thought, well, at least it's getting a science now because We've now moved from just normal marketing. You know, we've gone through the whole paradigm shifts from manufacturers to products to sales, and now to the, this enlightened world of marketing where we actually listen to our customers' needs. Along came digital and data and all the rest of it, and now we've got tons of stuff. We've got so much now, and we're talking about data mining and looking, you know, we always think that the, oh, the answer must be in the database somewhere, you know, or just get more information, and we pay tons of money for, reports that are of absolutely no use to us. I mean, a great example is things like, you know, these big Gartner reports and uh, Forrester and Aberdeen research reports that state, you know, we, we're not saying this, but we've looked at the Fortune 500 companies and the top 10 have all got red front doors. And if, we're not saying if you have a red front door, you'll be more competitive or you'll be a big company, but 
you're more likely to because they have as well. I mean, that's the kind of thing that's floating around in the world and it's just horrendous to try and keep up. So there was an awful lot more stuff. There's an awful lot more equations, an awful lot more data, and there's all this false complexity in the world, especially in marketing. There's a plethora of three-letter acronyms, which is, of course, a three-letter acronym in itself, and paradigms. We all have our paradigm shifts. I feel like sometimes, you know, when you're talking about these things, you're in an episode of The Office. You know, honestly, I mean, I hated The Office when it first came out because it was so painfully true. And uh, data, data, data on what? You know, we're, we're effectively measuring absolutely everything. And I think that's a mark of desperation as opposed to a realisation that we can actually use uh, customer information a little bit more effectively. And this word, which is great, and I, I, I always hesitate to use it in case I make a mistake on camera, is measurebation. Because we can measure everything now, we measure it absolutely everywhere. And that, that's actually a term that was coined by uh, Rory Sutherland of the... Uh, uh, of the I forgot what Rory works for now, uh, Ogilvy, Group, Ogilvy Group, you know, one of the big marketing agencies. But effectively, because we can measure everything now, we think, in desperation, the answer's in there somewhere. And of course, us marketers and software companies and IT and us digital chattering classes all love it now because we've now got dashboards. And I thought, well, here we go. At least we've got something to guide the ship by, you know, the good ship company. And effectively, all that does is really check what we're doing and how much we're doing it and who we're doing it to and give us this lovely pie chart. So it's an activitometer, as, uh, as the diagram suggests there. So after coming through all of that process from rigorous science and all that lovely touchy-feely helping humanity stuff, coming all the way through professional marketing, looking at it, chairing the CIM's technology group, tens of thousands of members and everything, finding it all wanting and even not having a definitive needs definition process, which I thought was, as I say, base one in marketing, I decided to do something about it. I took the P's up to 17 P's or rationalised them because I did see a couple of eyes roll in the head when I mentioned the P's. Um, and of course, the original four P's didn't even include people, which I thought was astounding. Um, but anyway, we took it up to the 17 P's, had enough of all of that. We've got too many product service options. Three letter acronyms galore, platforms and paradigms, digital social, stratagems, tactics, inadvertent commoditization because every one of us tries to do the same as everything else. You know, sometimes when you go around, not particularly this exhibition, but you go around exhibitions, you see, especially in particular industry segments, they all look the same. If you go around and you actually read the blurb, you look at the website, you look at the stands, they all look the same. So inadvertent commoditization because we're all trying to grasp at the same kind of things and tactics. So I found out zillions of options. I don't know if there is a word called zillion, but I just, I just thought it sounded good. Zillions of options. So I wrote two books about it, The Marketing Manifesto, to try and rationalise this for marketing, and Competitive SME, to make it a bit more palatable for smaller companies to, to realise how we can actually make things a little bit more effective. And I found there was fundamentals. I looked at this in a scientific way, and what I mean by that is I didn't get my slide rule and calculator out and spreadsheets and all the rest of it. I just actually started asking questions of marketers, of customers, of engineers, of academics, of clients, of everybody. And I found that actually there was a couple of errors, fundamental errors that we had, which was the more stuff we do, whether it's adding to the noise in the marketplace, social media, blah, 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 bombasting the customer or the market and the activity therein didn't actually necessarily lead to any more money. The fact that we were getting more information about the market, about the customer, that we're all filling in forms and we had surveys and blah, blah blah and aggregated data didn't actually lead to anything like return on investment. And just because we've got a number of options now and we've got different versions of our product, our service, we've got bells and whistles on it galore and we've now got 20 products when we used to have one, doesn't actually make us that more engaging. So, about a year and a half or so ago, I set up a company up at Edinburgh Napier with a couple of other guys. Uh, all three of us are not academics and, or students. Just a small disclaimer, nothing against academics and students. There's a lot of good ones, of course. Um, but this was primarily to look at this thing as a business. And uh, so we set up uh, Torchbearer up at uh, Edinburgh Napier. And we thought, right, there must be a better way of doing this. Fed up with tweaking. And that was the thing that came out of the, 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 the work that we did, looking at how we can be more competitive, as small businesses especially. And one engineer said to me, the best thing you effing marketers can do is stop the effing tweaking. 
because every time we come up with a product or a service or a proposition or an offer, we put it out there, change the, change the keyword, change the price point, change the color, change the logo, change the promotion, blah, 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 and the market gets fed up. So the single best way to improve return on investment, to restrict the noise and the stress, which is the number one problem in small businesses, the stress through management attention and, and pool and management attention, um, is uh, to make money, is to make our sales and marketing work to match our needs and wants was to get it right first time. So instead of getting you know, this amorphous product service offer, firing it out to the marketplace, tweaking with it, looking at all these different segments and just trying to jostle around in a very noisy uh, neighborhood, we decided the best thing we can do is actually start to work at this right first time and we're making some inroads in that. I'll give you a great a, a specific example here. Take a, a normal kind of uh, direct mail shot. You no, know, just a, a standard letter, um, just a you know a sales letter you send out to dear so and so with your latest offer. Now, say you had eight factors in there. That's eight different things in there that you wanted to test, like um, your opening remark, your heading, a, a keyword, a price point, a call off, or whatever, a sign off, I should say, or a call to action. Um, you had eight different. Um, things to do and within those you had three options so it's 24 different variables effectively in that one letter one letter doesn't sound a lot but when you look at those variables you think well actually 24 different variables that's an awful lot when you consider I want to know which is my best way of putting my offer together and articulating it so anybody want to make a stab as to how many campaigns you would actually have to send out this isn't how, may, how broad the campaign would be this is how many campaigns you'd have to send out to get an optimized offer with only eight different options. Over 3,200. Now, I'm a marketer and, you know, if I was in a marketing agency, I'd be rubbing my hands with glee because I'd be telling my, my customer, my client, my God, we've got to send out 3,200 campaigns and that'll, oh, that'll last me a good year or two maybe. And in year two, we'll maybe be able to op optimize your offer and by that time, everything's moved on. And of course, we all know 3,002 campaigns, one after the other, to a similar audience or the same audience is just going to cheese them right off and by the time you've gone through it all it's going to be too costly things have moved on competitive reactions and all the rest of it so that kind of number was just completely crazy so what would it be worth to everybody to actually shorten this from 3200 campaigns so that's what we effectively started to look at and we started to think, well, what is the defining way that we move forward? What is our objective in all this for the right first time, apart from articulating the offer correctly with one major competitive advantage in the offer rather than a hundred others? Is wouldn't it be nice just to define our best advantage? Because I've also found in life as a scientist that if you find the one thing that's right, hmm, everybody knows that's great, but you've also dumped 99 other things or a hundred other things or a thousand other things that everybody thinks is a great idea and that you should see that when you drop that because all of a sudden your stress levels go down you stop wasting money you stop pissing off customers and everybody has a better time of it all and there's a shared purpose starting to form and also going back to the measurebation thing is start to use better metrics that matter and dump those that don't now these are all obvious things to you and as i said i'm telling my granny how to suck eggs as they say in this part of the world but wouldn't it be great to be able to do it other than just talk about it and use the best description of your offer and to stop spending on poor promos and tweaking. So that was our thesis that we could actually achieve this and stop worrying about the competition and desperately tweaking with everything. One thing I've always found very strange is somebody coming in from science into marketing. Everybody get themselves all uh, buzzed up about what the competition is doing. And I was asking simple questions because it was simple to me. Um, how much time do you spend looking at your competitors and competition versus actually speaking to your customers? And I found that the bigger the company is, the worse that got. Because they started getting, you know, I mean, they actually started to formulate their own strategies just by looking at the competition as opposed to looking to, the, to their customers. And I found obviously they were still putting lipstick on the pig and we can stop that now. So, simple guy, although I came from robust science, I wanted a simple way of looking at all of this. And I thought, well, here's a nice wee equation whereby you've got knowledge on the one side, which is the ability to create and maintain a relevant, a relevant and strong USP. When I say relevant, I mean, I could have stood here in a Harlequin costume today and you would have thought, well, he's got a USP, I'll never forget him. 
but I'll be buggered if I'm actually going to buy from them. And uh, so, get a relevant USP, and related to that is the, 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 your ability to have good marketing effectiveness and to actually drill down your customers' needs to a few customer needs as opposed to looking at all customer needs, and that will give you true ROI. So, effectively, the one thing we're working on just now is looking at improving marketing effectiveness. We're getting a process together, which I invite, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about in a second, and invite you to come along. Um, it's to specifically try and get a process, a repeatable process, to stop this 3,000 requirement for 3,200 and reining that into 10, 20 maybe campaigns. So we need to get our marketing effectiveness better. That's truly better as opposed to just doing more. And secondly, funnily enough, I think this was kind of counterintuitive as well, was that we actually need to drill down those customer needs, as I said earlier. We don't really need to find a whole shitload of, of customer needs and then, oh, lo and behold, we can formulate a, you know, a plethora of different products and service offers. But we really need to actually nail it down to just one or two, because ultimately that's where we want to go in terms of niche marketing anyway. And that will give us some ROI. Now, again, this is a bit of a complex picture and you can see that elsewhere. Um, but Believe me, this is the simple, this is a simple version and it is simple. And what this effectively says is it boils down to three things effectively, which is this competitive advantage. A specific competitive advantage is best articulated from a major limitation that you have in your company or a major limitation in the marketplace. So that's the competitive advantage side. And the second thing is, is how we actually measure things. And I'll give you a great example of that in a second. But that's try, trying to change to the customer's currency in a business-to-business -business sense. I'm not so much talking about Mars bars, et cetera, and, and con, kind of consumer marketing here, but moving the, the currency over to something that the customer will actually understand. And as I said, we'll come, come back onto that in a second. And make this commitment to stop the tweaking and we can actually have an edge, because I did try to say, well, we always use these interchangeable words, competitive advantage and edge. Now, you can have a competitive advantage, but it's not necessarily an edge, and I think that articulates it an awful lot better. But believe me, it is actually quite simple. So the three things effectively, just in summary, are competitive advantage, optimized offer. So the competitive advantage is getting all these USPs and getting them down to one well-articulated one. The optimized offer is instead of sending it out tweaking with the keywords and price points and colors and whatever and uh, meta tags and things, uh, we actually pull that into an optimized offer. And the third, and really, really, I mean, this takes a lot to get to the customer currency, but that's a really exciting one because that changes pricing. It changes the way that you and the customer perceive value because you're on the same page for a change. Now, I said I'll give you a good example of that, and here's three of them. This one here is big company, Rolls-Royce, right? Rolls-Royce, the, the engine division, the airline engine division, they take the, uh, the, uh, the, the engines down, sort, sort them for the airline, pop them back up again, right? So the value for the airline is they want the airplanes up in the air. Yep, that's a given. The currency for Rolls-Royce was they, they're like quick fit parts and labor. You know, they want it on the ground, in their factories, doing stuff, putting things in, doing an awful lot. So the currencies were completely at odds. And what Rolls-Royce did was, they decided to do what they call power by the hour. And it's such a good process and a good kind of way of thinking that they've, they've, they've protected this phrase and everything to the nth degree. Don't use power by the hour, by the way, because they'll be after you. And well, maybe they won't, but, but the, the principle was that all of a sudden, Rolls-Royce decided, this is a number of years ago too, decided to charge based on how long the aeroplane engine under their jurisdiction was flying, as opposed to how long it was doing down on the ground. Now it's a fundamental, fundamental thing, and I'd love you to have a look at this because it's such a fundamentally different way of looking at the world than the way we do, where we go, we sell this and that's how we sell it and that's the number of ways we sell it, so we want you to buy it as, as often as possible and as deep as possible. This whole world was changed by saying, we are now on the same page. When your planes are up there, we're all happy, we're getting paid. Secondly, this was a, a physiotherapy uh, company, no names because it's through this part of the world. Um, and again, it was a, a two, two or three girls had a, a physiotherapy company. And what they did was they went out to offices and their business effectively was, they, they said to the company, if you have people who do uh, sporting, uh, sporting activities or they cycle to work or run to work, 
and you don't want them to be off, obviously. So when they get an injury, we'll come in, look at them because they don't always get to the GP, they don't always get the care and attention. We'll come in, make sure they're okay. We'll even maybe even visit them in the home, in their house, get them ready and get them back again. But they went through this kind of process and they thought, well, actually, here's a better way of doing it. Change to the customer's currency. We, we didn't use those terminologies at the time, but effectively that's what they were doing because we've just started using the customer currency as a phrase. What they did was now they go into the company and they say, we will audit all the people who are sporting people or people who cycle to work or run to work or whatever and are likely to have possibly get uh, some kind of uh, injury. We'll come in and check them all on an ongoing basis and it won't cost you any more. And we'll do that and we'll make sure they're not off. And what happened? What happened? Absenteeism went down and that was the currency. So they, instead of saying, anytime we turn up, we're charging you, which is our currency by the hour, by the half day or whatever. And the company is going, well, actually my currency is not that because I'm, I'd only buy you in to stop these people being off too long. And I want them fit and healthy and happy because I like my employees as well. All of a sudden they're on the same page. And the last one there is a good example again, which is a laboratory services company. Now, if, if, you've, you, know, if you produce uh, water, you need that tested, you need it analyzed. If you've got a, a refinery that's spewing out pollution, uh, you need it analyzed to make sure you don't fall foul of legislation and consumer laws and all sorts of things. And if, you are, uh, you know, if you're taking the Ravenscraig site and you're taking all the topsoil off and treating it and making sure it's repurposable, you want to do that, but you have to sample it to make sure there's no chromium, hexavalent chromium and all this kind of stuff and cyanide's kicking around. So anyway, this laboratory service gave, well, basically samples was their thing. They had samples coming in, they'd analyze it and give a result back. Now, so, ergo, samples was their currency. They liked samples and they wanted more samples. One of their customers was a company like that one that does the, the, uh, the re uh, remediation at uh, Ravenscraig and they shift soil. But their big challenge was, where do I actually sample? Because this is costing me every single sample I have is going to cost me. And it cost them about 120 quid every time just to sample. So they had this ongoing problem about I want to take as many samples as I can, depending on my budget and depending on my time and other things. But I don't want to take too many because obviously that cost me, but I don't want to take too few because otherwise I'm really going to get my bottom felt by SEPA, for instance. So again, more samples, less samples, two different currencies, very simple, using the same, you know, medium, if you like, but certainly two different currencies. So what actually ended up is a long, laborious process to, to get through all of this. But effectively, what they ended up doing was helping the land remediation company shift soil. Because the land remediation company's currency wasn't how many samples am I doing, blah, -de blah, -de blah. It was, I need to shift soil and I need to shift it as quickly as possible. And if I'm having to sit around with my committee, my health and safety person, my occupational health person, my environmental person, and we're having to do all these samples and blah, -dee blah and waste an awful lot of time and money where I can just send you as many samples as possible as I think I need. And they were incredulous when this happened. And they said, no, you're going to lose money. And we said, believe us, we're not going to lose money. And we did it. And that com that, these companies that did this, this particular change of currency, they actually ended up spending more money with the laboratory services company. But more importantly, their in their currency, they actually got an awful lot more return in terms of pounds out of it. So they sat down and went, this is fantastic. We don't have to have these meetings anymore. We have a quick recce, we send you all the samples and you will deal with it quickly. And you know, they actually got more projects. I mean, they moved, I mean, they take acres of ground and, and remediate it. So I think they moved from something like 12 projects in that year to 14. Doesn't sound much, but multi, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds worth of stuff. I hope these give you an idea of what I'm trying to get to with this, because there, there is another way. I'm going to finish up in a second. So. I would like to start to think about proper value creation and rather than value grabbing. It was one of my colleagues, I'm now involved in the 
snappy titled new um, professional membership organisation which is Customer Value Creation International but it is the only membership body I think that actually looks at, at value as an agent or creating value as an agent of the customer as opposed to just the company. So it's cvci.org I think is, the, is the, uh, the URL. So, but it was one of my colleagues at CVCI that created this, this whole notion that companies are almost predisposed in their DNA to be grabbing value from the market, exploiting. That's what we're all told we should be doing rather than creating it in a true way. And I don't know if you've heard about the maker revolution. It's tied to crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. Now, crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, I think more or less everybody's probably heard about. But as a marketer and a scientist, I thought, you're actually going to put out a message. These people who may be your clients and customers are going to not only probably buy from you or pledge to buy from you. They're also going to give you information that goes into your product development and there's a market when you come to sell it. And they're going to talk to everybody about it. And I thought, my God, this is happening now. You know, it's, not, it's imperfect yet and it's still full of a whole lot of problems, but this is the way it's going. And I thought, wow, this is actually classic marketing now. And the maker revolution is where people are now spotting a, pro a problem going online getting the bits of things, sticking it together, saying, this is what I'm going to make, what do you think? And everybody goes, that's a real problem, pledging money and selling. And some of these crowdfunding projects are unbelievable now, if you get it right. So things are moving, and well, I guess what I'm trying to say here is the opportunity is there that was never there before. More isn't necessarily right with data, more isn't necessarily right with technologies and platforms, but there's now a shift in the way we can do things which we couldn't do before, especially as small businesses. We can change our fundamental measurements as well because we have been measuring things in the wrong way. And just because we can measure everywhere doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get any, any further forward. And let's face it, we've even been, I think it's, we've been using the same way of um, recording and lodging profit and loss and balance sheets since 1856, for goodness sake. I mean, as a marketer, you know yourself, it took so long before even accountants and finance directors realised that a brand and goodwill was of value. You know, for goodness sake, you know. I was going to swear in front of the, that, that phrase because ah, finance directors and accountants, they know the price of everything but the value of nothing, as uh, Oscar Wilde said. We didn't say it about accountants, I think. And specifically at the bottom of all of this, and I think is the most important thing from today, is try and get one advantage, one offer. And by that I mean a one articulated offer and one edge, because more isn't necessarily better. And indeed, a great, another great example of, a, of the modern day is publishing. Now, I published two books, as you saw there. I'm not going with the publishers anymore. I'm doing this by myself, self-publishing through my channels and networks, because I've got more control over that now. And I don't need, because of the internet, because of the digital stuff, because of the modern world we live in, we don't have to look at our catchment area in small areas of Glasgow or Scotland or Europe or whatever. We've now got a global audience. Many of us have a global audience, but the point is it's the same principle, that because of all these things that are enabling us now, we don't need to rely on the old way of doing things. And I think self-publishing is a great example of that because I don't, just as your man was here earlier on was talking about the guy who's talking about the, um, the, the uh, doing telemarketing, etc. He doesn't need thousands of customers, you know? He only needs a few. You guys probably don't need thousands of customers either, really. But the technology is all there for us to be a little bit more clever about it all. So the right first time process, as I said, in a nutshell, is taking all these activities and options that you have, the huge marketing mix of whatever, how many P's we've got now, down to the campaign mix, how many ways we can articulate our offer to our absolute best offer and get it as quickly as we possibly can. And we've actually got that down to a process which is 15 days or thereabouts, five days for competitive advantage, five days for um, the, uh, the optimization of the offer and five days for the, uh, the, uh, the, the articulation of the customer currency, changing to the customer currency. But I think you might not be ready for that one yet because I think the first two you can understand, well, not you can understand, but the first two I think are re readily um, graspable, but the third one is, it does require a bit of effort, but 15 days isn't too bad. So, in summary, you can still put lipstick on a pig, but it is still a pig. And I, quite frankly, I'm fed up of going along to an awful lot of marketing, inverted commas, marketing events, and there's just more. You know, as I said, we're, we've now got Twitter, we've got Instagram tomorrow, it's going to be uh, 
Pinterest and blah -de blah the next day. And uh, so more isn't necessarily good and I'm fed up putting lipstick on a pig. And Burns there had the phrase, which I think is wonderful, award some power the gift to gear us to see ourselves as others see us. It would make, it would free money a blunder free us and foolish notion, which is great for marketers to say, well, it's about time we started properly, not just listening to the, to the market and to the customers and prospects, but stop thinking that we know it all and more is necessarily better.